Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Level. Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast, everyone. I am your host, Dr. J. Tita. I am here with my new friend, Megan Lyons. I was recently on her show, Wellness Your Way. She has a podcast as well that recently came out, and we wanted to do a podcast swap because she is just, you know, super amazing and has a lot to share. We're going to cover today. Obviously, Megan, you do a lot of things and talk about a lot of things, but you and I were talking about the idea that. I've been on a gut sort of uh, kick lately, and I do kind of like when uh, I'm hitting podcasts to get a lot of different people on a topic to discuss. I mean, obviously, gut protocols are everywhere you look now, and I think a lot of people have a lot of questions. I also know you, like me, are an expert in endocrine function, hormone function. And there is this term that maybe, uh, you know, I have a lot of practitioners that listen to this show. So a lot of you listeners know this term. But for those of you who are not listeners or are new, this idea of neuroendocrine immune. And we could even say psycho neuroendocrine yep. immune. And this idea that our psychology impacts our nervous system, the way we think impacts the way we feel, that impacts our hormonal system, that impacts our immune system. And that the gut is a big hub of this. And so I really want to unpack uh, all of this with you and just get your take on it. You know, I want to learn for myself and I just want the listener to be able to hear, um, you know, sort of how two practitioners, uh, you know, sort of look at this. And so why don't we start with you just giving everyone uh, who is not familiar with you a little bit of your story, how you got into this work, your background, all the things, and then we'll get into this discussion. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to see where this conversation goes today. I own a practice called the Lion Share Wellness, which is here in Dallas, although these days more clients are not in Dallas than they are in Dallas. Even my team of nutritionists, uh, zero of them are in Dallas. So we're a, a global nutrition consulting firm. And I got into this work the winding way, which I think is actually more common than uh, than not. I started as a high achiever, which will be important as we go through my story, just everything competitive against myself, always trying to do the most, which worked in a lot of different ways. I went to Harvard, studied economics there, did well in school, and was uh, happy on the outside and, and on the inside too. I think if you had asked me, am I happy? I would have said yes. I didn't really uh, know how to explore that deeper. And so I was just kind of going through the motions, going, going, going. As part of that journey, I had never really exercised as a child. I ate the standard American diet. We didn't know any different. But I met this cute guy on move-in day of college who's now my husband 20-plus years later, uh, but he was on the track and cross-country team. So I thought, hmm, I should probably get his attention and learn to run. (laughs) So I went out for a run. I felt amazing. I really, well, actually, probably the first couple of runs I felt terrible, but very quickly I felt amazing. I got this runner's high. I got really pulled into it. And so I started running more and more and more. 
I started, quote, trying to learn about nutrition, which back in those days, before I knew what PubMed was, before access to social media, even any of this kind of stuff, I was reading magazines. I was reading self and fitness and shape and who knows what magazines. And they were telling me, just eat less, eat half a protein bar for lunch. I would literally have a balance bar for lunch and fold over the wrapper and put it in my top desk drawer. Like that was my lunch, half a balance bar. And you can probably guess where this story goes. I just too much took this to the extreme of running and under fueling. And I got into a pretty deep adrenal, hormonal, everything crash. So when I was 23, this took several years, right? I wasn't 23 in college, but I kept going for several years. At 23, I went into a doctor's office. I said, I feel like junk. I don't know what's happening. Thankfully, she ran my hormones. I feel very grateful because that was pretty progressive looking back then. Um, And she came back and she looked at me and she said, hmm, I don't really know what's going on. Your hormones are lower than the postmenopausal women that I see. You must just have to be on medication the rest of your life. And that just started in me something that felt like, I don't know the answer, but this is not the answer for me. And I'm not totally anti-medication. I think, you know, great. Have I taken medication? Of course. Will I again? Of course. But at that moment, the medication was not the answer for me. I knew I could fix it uh, with how I was living my life, how I was uh, treating my mentality, treating myself internally, how I was feeling, all of that. So long story, uh, but to wrap it up, that got me into real nutrition. And once you kind of feel it, it's so hard to not share it. So I did go back to management consulting. I got my MBA. I I went back to management consulting again, but in 2014, I eventually left and haven't looked back since. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's a, it's a really powerful story. And I think when I talk to a lot of practitioners who do this work, they have similar stories about confronting sort of health issues and when they're young and thinking to themselves, there has to be another way. And isn't it, it is kind of interesting. You're right. On the one hand, it's super progressive that your doctor ran your hormones at that yes. time. And the other sense, and I want to get your, your take on this, the idea that, that the fact that she or he did not know, she didn't yeah, know she, that yeah. what the cause was, because I think for people like you and I, I would predict like, you know, if you came into me reporting certain symptoms and I was like, okay, so you're a runner, you're restricting calories. You've been doing that for years. I wouldn't even have to run hormones. Probably right. neither would you to right. know exactly what's going on. But again, uh, traditional doctors are not trained that way. And that is going back to some, some time, but it is really interesting because we see this stuff, uh, all of the time. Well, actually, let me put it this way. Cause this will be a good way for you and I to, um, to powwow on this. I see this all the time. You see this all the time, perhaps yes. because we are perceptually aware of what's going on. However, I can tell you as early as just a couple years ago, because certainly I wrote my first book on this stuff back in 2010, a book wow. called The Metabolic Effect Diet. I wrote my first book on this idea that overdoing exercise and underfeeding for long periods of time is a stress to the metabolism in the same way that overeating and not moving can be a stress to the metabolism. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was uh, brand new, perhaps light years ahead of, you know, what most people were thinking, not that I came up with it, but there were very few practitioners who were speaking this way. But even two years ago, I had a run in with a very prominent um, uh, health and fitness influencer, PhD in biochemistry and nutrition telling me, this is two years ago in a very uh, public debate, telling me this can't happen essentially, or that this doesn't happen. And I was dumbfounded that even in, you know, uh, 2022, that someone who is, you know, this is someone who's, uh, I won't name names because it's just not appropriate. And I have no issues with the guy anyway, but it was just really interesting that this debate occurred, uh, him uh, saying that this can't happen. Now, one of the things that I kind of, you know, I know that he's a guy who works with mainly young men, right? Yeah. And is that's mainly his, uh, and he is a, a younger guy. But from my perspective, clinically, this kind of thing happens often, not yes. all the time, by the way. I mean, certainly you have some women who will do what you're doing, uh, you know, and 
do fine with it. Uh, yep. But but it is fairly prevalent. And I want to yeah. just get your your take on that, uh, how you see this. Do you think that people are uh, now aware of this? Do you still have to do a lot of education on this? And just walk me through how you even see uh, what was happening then. Now, again, I know we're going to talk a little bit about the entire psychoneuroendocrine immune sort of thing and perhaps focus on the gut. But from my perspective, what we're talking about here is the neuroendocrine, mm-hmm. the nervous system endocrine piece of this. And I think it's a, a nice place to begin the discussion. So I'm just wondering how you see that. Yeah, well, there's so much there. And I think to your point on starting with neuroendocrine, it wasn't just looking back that I was just over exercising. I was for sure. And I was under fueling, but also I was under sleeping. I was under extreme stress management consulting. You're working 80 hours a week, traveling 48 weeks a year, which was fine for many people to your point. But when we layer all this stuff on top of each other, it didn't work out in my case. And I think that's part of why we're seeing it a little more frequently. Our allostatic load, which to the listeners is just our accumulation of stressors, that's getting so high these days because of the fast pace of life, because of technology, because of toxins, because of all the things. So our buckets are fuller quicker. And that leads to this feeling of burnout that I was feeling and that many other people feel. So I think it is increasing in prevalence. And then also to your point, I think we, you and I, and probably many other similar practitioners, we do attract these people because honestly, if someone out there has never tried to eat healthy, healthily and has never tried to exercise, it does likely work for them to do some exercise and to eat some more vegetables and to clean up their proteins and things like that. And so they don't need us. And I I feel very happy in continuing to recommend all the things that I was doing just at a much uh, less extreme scale. So a lot of this stuff does work. It's just Goldilocks. When we take it too far, it's too much for our bodies and our body in looking to protect us starts shutting down some of these quote non-essential Uh, systems that feel very essential. Having lived that experience, it didn't feel good. We'll be back after a quick break. Breaking into the show real quick, because I want to tell you about a brand new free, absolutely free offer from Next Level Human. And you are going to love this, and it is going to give you fantastic results for your health and fitness. Right now, the research area in health and fitness is all abuzz with something called VILPA, Vigorous Intermittent Lifestyle Physical Activity, otherwise known as exercise snacks or exercise bursts. Think about it this way. You wake up in your day at 8 a.m., you do one or two minutes of intense activity. Then you go about your day. A couple hours later, you do it again. A couple hours later, again. A couple hours later, again. And maybe finally again in the evening. And what this does, this very short one to three minute intermittent burst spread out throughout the day, give you similar benefits to your traditional intense exercise. In fact, a 2022 study in Nature Medicine found that this reduced cancer risk by 40%. Cardiovascular disease by 40%. And this was just four bouts of one to three minute intermittent activity throughout the day. When they looked at doing more than that, up to 11 bouts, it was a 65% reduction for cardiovascular events. This is incredibly powerful. And what I wanted to do is offer this free to the next level human community. All you need to do is go to drj.com slash snacks Register absolutely free to get these via email. And more importantly, all you need to do is put your text number in, your mobile number in, and we will text these to you four times throughout the day. Follow along intermittent workouts that you can do. These short, intense, one to three minute workouts in video and audio format that you can get to your text, turn on, get them done super quick, And then be done. And the beautiful thing about this, you can do them anywhere during your day because they're so short. You do not need to sweat. You won't need to shower afterwards. This is an incredibly powerful way for us to get the physical fitness benefits that we need to keep our bodies healthy and fit. And I have seen 
very effective results for people with weight loss as well. So go over to drjade.com slash snacks. Get these intermittent, vigorous activity snacks of one to three minutes free to your email and your text and start getting results with your health and fitness and improving your health right now. drjade.com slash snacks. I hope you really love this free service from Next Level Human. And let's get back to the show. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Just yesterday, I'll, I'll just uh, walk you through. This is a case that I just had yesterday. Yes. So this is, a, this is a woman who came in and had gone through a pretty severe breakup with a man that she fell in love with. And he was pretty manipulative uh, to her. And she went through a very stressful time uh, with family members around the same time. So a lot of stuff happening at once. Loss of a loved one. This breakup happening. Uh, stuff at work, stuff with some legal things that she was involved in and immediately got her period and did not stop bleeding and Oof. had gone to several different uh, physicians and um, doctors and f- was surprised that for me, I was like, I know exactly uh, what's going on here. And very yeah. similar thing, also an exerciser, also someone who's a striver. And to me, we see this often. And I think it's really interesting that you say that because these people do tend to find us. And I oftentimes wonder, is it that they find us and we we recognize them? Because I do know that, that the prevalent story is they often go looking around and yeah. I don't think their condition or what's going on with them is recognized by a lot of practitioners. And so then when they sit down across from people like you and me, we go, I know exactly what is happening here yes. because we're not looking at metabolism through the lens of this very narrow calories in, calories out, or this very narrow, you've got a particular diagnosis and here's a set of cookbook recipes to follow right. if you get this diagnosis. We're looking at it like the metabolism is a stress barometer, a stress yes. thermostat, and your thermostat is broken in the same way or dysfunctional in the same way that your uh, thermostat on your home AC unit might be from yes. running the you know uh, system too hot in the same way that a, an electrical you know uh, company might have to go to blackouts because too much stress is being put on the system. This is what's happening to a lot of people and they often don't uh, relate to it uh, this way. And so I'm curious now when you see this, I mean, obviously we've talked about this idea of a woman who gets her period and can't stop bleeding. Uh, Something like you, where you hit fatigue, you feel incredibly horrible. Other things that begin to happen. What are some of the other signs and symptoms for listeners who are for the first time hearing two practitioners uh, talk about this besides fatigue, besides menstrual issues, uh, libido issues for men, the same thing can happen. They can start to get libido and erection issues. Women can get libido and menstrual issues and it hits in other places. So where other, what are the other places that you see people have dysfunction here? Yeah. Great question. And the symptoms kind of like when we talk about thyroid or gut health or whatever, the symptoms are so wide ranging that it is almost impossible, in my opinion, to give a, this is the set of symptoms and that applies to everyone. For example, in my experience, I lost my period for over 12 months. This woman that you were seeing, she kept her period for too long. So it can go either way and and similar with some of the other symptoms as well. That fatigue that you're mentioning though, I like to think of it as physical, emotional, mental fatigue, almost like, oh, I've lost the the drive to be myself anymore. So it's not just like, oh, I'm kind of yawning two hours after lunch, which might just be a simple blood sugar issue. It's more of a deeply drained fatigue is what I see in people. I I was actually just talking to someone yesterday experiencing similar issues, uh, very similar to you seeing someone to yes seeing someone yesterday. And she was saying, I just feel like my eyelids are closing in the morning and I'm trying to open them. She has kids. She, she wants to be there and wants to be energized and she just can't. So it's that really deep fatigue. But what else do we see after that? 
I think going down your path of neuro and all of the endocrine things that follow, we can see certainly thyroid-like symptoms like hair thinning, um, eyebrow thinning. We can see temperature irregularity. We can certainly see weight issues. Some people with adrenal dysfunction tend to hold on to weight. I find that more common. Some people actually tend to lose weight if, if it is leading them to not be able to eat regularly or have appetite changes, certainly sleep irregularities. I find even though people are fatigued during the day, they do tend towards that racing mind insomnia at night. Their circadian rhythms are just totally messed up. Uh, Sugar cravings, almost always I see people with sugar cravings when they have some kind of adrenal dysregulation. And that's your body's last ditch effort to be like, hey, I need something to keep me going. And again, sugar works. Like, does it give you energy if you eat a whole pack of jelly beans? Of course it does for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. It just doesn't work over the long term. So those are some of the more common ones I see, but I'm curious to see what you would add on. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And and the way I see this is like, let's say if we go back to this stress barometer, this idea of the stress thermostat uh, just for the listener, I know you know this, Megan, and then just correct me if I'm if you think I'm wrong on anything or want to add anything here. The way I see it is that this area, the reason why these symptoms can be so varied is because really the, the major site of, let's say, dysfunction or uh, distress is the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which is yeah. basically the command and control center of the metabolism. It's kind of that it acts as the stress barometer. It measures stress and then it acts as the stress thermostat. It basically sends out signals to the thyroid, the gonads, ovaries, testicles, and the adrenal glands, which then have to, uh, are the major endocrine organs. Of course, it does more signals than that, but these are the major ones. And so you can see dysfunction across each of those areas. So this is why you can yeah. see menstrual issues, libido issues, you can see uh, fatigue issues, you can which you know the where the adrenals and the thyroid get involved. You can see uh high blood pressure and low blood pressure. You can see a lot of this yin and yang that you mm-hmm. alluded to. You have either hyper functioning or hypo functioning. And one of the things that this by the way is sort of a cheat sheet for you listeners, but it's not always the case. But in general, I see two types of people, sort of the puffy, heavier type of stressed stress dysfunction. These are the people who lean more hypothyroid. They lean more tired in the brain and tired in the body. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have this more thinner, uh, you know, sort of phenotype, which uh, seems to maybe hit the adrenals a little bit more in my mind where you get sort of this more thin appetite wired in the brain, tired in the body, yep. maybe a little bit more storage of fat around the middle. And I see these again as the same dysfunction, one being a hypo functioning, uh, you know, sort of way that the body tries to adjust and one's being more of a hyper functioning way that the body uh, tries to adjust. And then that gets down into the gut, which I know is a big a piece of your uh, expertise, which then the gut actually is one of my favorite places to look at signs and symptoms because it also will illustrate uh, this sort of balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, sort of the rest digest nervous system and the stimulating, you know, uh, struggle and striving uh, nervous system. And so you can see uh, things from constipation for some people, the, the more puffy, heavier types tend towards yep. more constipation. You got the, the people who are more lo- loose stools, diarrhea. You got a lot of people who are really guy- going back and forth, things like IBS, lots of, mm-hmm. uh, lots of GERD, heartburn, uh, all of these kinds of things. I like to see the gut as one of the places where I kind of see it as one of the most sensitive areas yeah. to uh, judge some of my function. Of course, nowadays we have tech, you know, so we can use tech to see things like heart rate variability, heart rate uh, levels at night, how fast the heart rate gets to its minimum, things like whoop and, you know, things like Apple watches and things like R rings and, and those kinds of things. But in general, that's kind of how I see it. I do kind of see this idea of sort of a hypo functioning phenotypical type and a hyper functioning phenotypical type. But I'm wondering um, how you see that. Uh, as well. Totally agree. And in 
explaining this to clients, I'll use slow for the one that you described as the more puffy individual, that slow metabolism, it's slow brain, it's slow uh, hair growth, it's slow digestion or constipation. Everything is slow in that hypofunctioning individual. And then hyper is fast, racing heartbeat, um, night sweats, anxiety, fast thinking, fast digestion or diarrhea, everything's fast in that case. Mm. And one other thing that you mentioned, I definitely agree that it goes back to the hypothalamus. And I don't think we as a collective society pay enough attention to the hypothalamus in part because it's harder to measure hypothalamic function. So we always say HPA axis. I always say HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. But I don't really pay attention to the H as much as to the P and to the A because adrenals we can measure to some extent, although even though I run the diurnal saliva cortisol four times during the day, sometimes I still don't even find the answers that I know are there in that. Pituitary, can we measure growth hormone and TSH and uh, ACTH and whatever? Yes, it's just harder in my experience to measure anything from the hypothalamus. But I think you're right. That's the control system. And I think we as practitioners, myself included, are missing a lot of that. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that? I love that you say that because I agree, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal. But what we also know nowadays that we now see, like let's take the thyroid for example. One of the reasons, if you're a listener listening to this and you're like, well, I have some of these symptoms. I thought I had hypothyroid. I went and checked it and my thyroid seems to be, quote, fine. But then you're hearing someone like Megan say, I know it's there, even though you're not Because one of the things we're seeing in the research is that each cell, so the body regulates thyroid function, but it also regulates thyroid usage. And it does this at the level of the cell. So each cell actually is regulating the amount of thyroid that it wants to take in or not. And a stressed out cell, a cell that is dysfunctional, will oftentimes decrease its thyroid hormone intake and slow itself down, almost going into a cocoon type state or a uh, sort of hibernation state to protect itself. And that's why we have to run full thyroid panels. That's why some of us get things like reverse T3 and other markers that tell us if this sort of cellular hypothyroidism is going on. But it is notoriously difficult because what we are doing is we're making a best guess and we will tend to focus on the big three. Oh, this is the ovaries or testicles. Oh, this is coming from the adrenal or, oh, this is coming from uh, the thyroid when oftentimes the major site of this shared dysfunction is the hypothalamus. And then we also forget that each cell and tissue, and this is something that has been, you know, sort of worked out over the last, you know, decade or so, you know, that each cell and tissue is regulating its own hormonal uptake and input and output as well. So there's this constant back and forth, which makes our job even more difficult. So One of the things that I have uh, found ironically is I used to be a guy who just runs test after test after test after test. And it really is funny how how much I rely on my clinical symptom recognition for a lot of this now. And I'm just curious how, how you see that. Oh, I'm so torn on this because I... I'm a data person. Like I said, I st- or I don't know if I said, but I studied economics in college. I love data. I love numbers. I love math. I would love it if it were possible to run a test and literally have a blueprint of everything we can do in a body. And that's why the uh, appeal or the idea of these tests is so alluring to me. I want it to be that simple, but it's not. Even when we do get tests, like in your example, oh, my doctor says my thyroid is fine. Well, they just ran TSH, and I think it's impossible to draw conclusions just from that TSH. So even when we do have the numbers, it's a complex algorithm that we as practitioners are running in our head of, okay, this is here, this is here, symptoms are here, history is here poof, we put it all together and that's where we come up with the solution oftentimes. So I don't know is the answer. Do I run tests on my clients? Yes, I do. Do I have some people come in who say it's either cost prohibitive or I've been tested out the wazoo and I don't want to do that or I just have no desire? Absolutely. And can I still work with them? 
absolutely. It really, I think, just depends on the person. I would say 90% we can do it based on gut instinct. And then sometimes there are some cases like gut testing, since we keep touching on that, most of the time it's simple to fix the gut and we can kind of tell based on what's coming into the gut and how we're treating our body, what to do. But sometimes I just get stuck. I'm like, I I don't know. I could use some more information. So I do think testing is valuable there. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And the way hundred percent of testing is valuable. Uh, I just, I oftentimes am frustrated and certain tests are, are better than others. I do think there are certain tests you can run, you know, that can essentially point directly. Obviously, you know, we have, you know, someone comes in and you run a test and you say, oh, they have an infection with this thing. We can give this antibiotic. Obviously, medicine works that way. And that's why conventional medicine, traditional medicine is so amazing with certain treatments. But in this yep. world of, I, I would say, functional medicine, it can be tricky. And, and the analogy yeah. I would use is imagine we have, I don't know, a million, although it's probably a billion or a trillion. You got a, a million different biomarkers, let's say, and different yes. chemicals floating around the body. And we measure a hundred of them. It's not even you know, a drop, you know, in, in the ocean. So that's why it can be so difficult, but there are big ones that can, that we know uh, can make a big difference. For example, you know, from my perspective, if you have something like the thyroid gland or the gut, uh, especially these are what I might call sentinel tissues where meaning that they're the ones who get hit first, you know, like the sentinel guard in the castle, if the castle gets attacked, the sentinel guards are the first ones to get hit. The gut, the thyroid, some of these things act as like sentinel tissues where they are the ones that uh, get hit first. And so we oftentimes will look to them. They also tend to oftentimes get better first before the other things, uh, you know, sort of uh, get get better. And so I do think that they're incredibly useful uh, and uh, not to not do them. But I also think that a lot of people are frustrated, including practitioners, because they don't always point us um, to you know, what we need to do. Although, and this is where we can kind of get into sort of the the stuff around the gut and the nervous system and putting this whole thing together, because I do think that in our style of medicine or our style of healthcare, there are big global things that we can do that help support the body's healing in general. Like one of the things that, uh, you know, before I went to naturopathic school, I was on my way to East Carolina University Medical School. And I remember first looking at the curriculum and going, okay, there's no nutrition, there's no exercise, and there's no psychology in this. And also the philosophy was drugs and surgery and nothing wrong with that, you know, because those things are necessary and I'm not anti any of that. I just didn't want to do that medicine. One of the first things I learned at naturopathic medical school is the body has healing, natural healing capability. They call this vis. Medicatory nature, which basically means, you know, nature has healing capacity. And we all know this, by the way. If you twist your ankle, all you got to do is usually if you stay off of it, it's going to get better. If you cut your finger, you just keep it clean and it's usually going to get better. And I like this idea with clients because from my perspective, what we can do, usually there are things that we can do that if we give the body the right environment, it oftentimes can heal itself. So this is like things like get people moving get people eating a whole foods, nutrient rich calorie, you know, less calorie diet usually is going to be, you know, healing for a lot of people. But when we're talking about some of what you and I do, this is the part of the discussion I want to have with you. These things often for these people right here, you are running like crazy, doing all the things. Yes, you're sort of nutrient depleting, but it's not what we typically think about. It's not the, the, the sick couch potato who's you know, essentially ill because they're over consuming or, you know, living a poor, poor diet. It's something else. And this brings me to this idea of nervous system regulation and what gets us stuck in this and how we can begin to regulate the nervous system uh, sort of in a different way, which uh, brings me to many things in my head. But I'm wondering, what are the things that you look at, you know, besides just diet and exercise, if anything, that you do to begin to work on this globally to create the atmosphere, the environment for the body to heal itself? We'll be back after a quick break. Breaking into the show real quick, I want to tell you about a signature program 
from Next Level Human. And I want to start out by asking you, what is the major thing that is keeping most people from getting the results, the transformation they want in their four jobs? What keeps people stuck in health and fitness, in finance and career, in personal relationships, and in finding deep purpose and meaning? Well, from my perspective, the thing that is keeping them stuck is that they think they're supposed to find these things elsewhere. They think they're supposed to be studying podcasts and gurus and documentaries and books and blogs and all of these things. But the fact of the matter is there is only one rule in personal development and health and fitness, and that rule is do what works for you. Now, if you're going to follow the rest of the self-development and health and fitness world, what they're going to tell you is they're going to say, do it my way. Do it this way. Become a carnivore person. Become a paleo person. Learn some communication skills. Change your habits and your behaviors, and you're going to get the results. All you have to do is follow my recipe, my cookbook tactic, my one-size-fits-all way of doing things. And this does not work, and this keeps us stuck. And so what I wanted to do is create a one-stop shop that gives you all the things you need to create and build a program that works for you in all your four jobs. What if there was a hub, a membership that had workout libraries, that had course libraries, that had 24-7 access to ask questions, that had live trainings every month, that had live Q&As every month, that gave you everything you needed to learn what works for you, to master what works for you, and to create and build a lifestyle you can love, live with, and get results from. Teach you a process, not a protocol. And what if all of this, which by the way is crammed with $2,000 worth of value, what if all of that was just available for $20 per month? That's what we have done with the Next Level Human Inner Circle. It is a complete membership, complete with Facebook community, workout library, course library, 24-7 chat access, access to me for Q&As, access to me to see as your personal coach, all the things that you need to get results that match you and your unique physiology, psychology, preferences, and practical circumstances. The inner circle is the thing that I wanted to create that every single person could get access to because it's about as cheap as a weekly coffee habit. The inner circle is what I believe is going to change you being stuck in your personal development and your health and fitness because it will teach you a process and give you all the education needed and all the wisdom needed to get results. To get involved with the inner circle, all you have to do is go to drjade.com slash inner circle. That's drj.com slash inner circle. I cannot wait to work with you inside the next level human membership community, the inner circle. Please go over there right now. Go ahead and sign up and I will see you on the other side. Yes. Well, I love what you just said so much. And I want to add on there is an analogy that I use with my clients that I think for people in in my age tends to really resonate. We'll see if it works for you and your listeners, Jade. Do you remember a toy called the Etch-a-Sketch? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. So this is not an Etch-a-Sketch. I, am, uh, I do not hang on to it. This is more of a tablet, but an Etch-a-Sketch looks like a tablet. And for those who aren't uh, familiar with the idea, kids would have this little pen. It would mark on the tablet. And then you have this slider at the bottom that would erase what the markings that the, the kid put on. And so it works great. It's super fun, keeps the kids entertained. 
But if the kid just goes crazy for a little bit and smacks the pen all over and gets so much, quote, ink, which is actually just a um, magnetic response, whatever, but really goes crazy on the Etch-A-Sketch, then that slider gets stuck and doesn't work anymore. And this is exactly what happens in our gut. Our gut is has a magic slider. It is willing to clear and heal and do all of this stuff. If we happen to, you know, eat a little bit of... Um, glyphosate one time or something like that, it is so happy to clear that up. But if we are pelting it constantly day after day with things that are irritating for it, we're like that kid with a really overzealous marker on his Etch-A-Sketch, and then our slider just gets stuck and can't clear and needs a little help. So I almost oversimplify it intentionally for my clients. I have this handout that has all the inflammatory foods on one side and all the anti-inflammatory foods and practices, stress and all of uh, stress relief, meditation, all of that kind of stuff on the other side. And you and I know that it's not quite that simple. Like we can't actually put everything into two columns, but sometimes seeing that for people really helps. Oh, okay, ultra processed food and alcohol and added sugar and stress. I just have to lay off the etch a sketch with those things for a little while and increase some of this healing stuff, some really good quality water, sleeping at an optimal time, optimal protein, great vegetables and fruits, all of that kind of stuff. We just have to shift that balance a little bit. So I do think even though it's oversimplified, it can be helpful to think about there's not one magic thing. We're just pelting our gut with so much over time. And that leads into your question about the nervous system. I like to simplify things. You'll get this point. But I ask clients, if I had a magic button and I could give you one free day tomorrow where you can't be productive, you can't play with the kids even though you love them, you can't do the laundry, you can't work, you can't do anything, quote, productive, you just get to do something. You could fly to a beach in Bali and have someone, you know, feed you uh, fresh fish all day, or you could go to a Beyonce concert, or you could do whatever. What would you do? And they look at me like I have three heads, but then eventually they spit out some answer. That to me is a really big key to what they're missing. So if they did say, I want to go to a Beyonce concert, well, great. Maybe they're missing some more stimulation, being around people. Maybe that's what they need to heal. Or if they said a beach in Bali, maybe they need some downtime. They need some alone time. They need to turn their brain off. But almost always our gut instinct there helps us develop a plan for nervous system regulation. I love that so much. And actually, let's go, let's go into an area that perhaps, um, is maybe a little bit different. It's an area that I've been focused on a lot, and I want to see if you have any thoughts on this. And it's and if you don't, it's also fine. But have you done anything with your clients around the idea of childhood development, adolescent development, young adult development, and the idea of a stuck nervous system? So let me just frame this for uh, Megan. I see her nodding her head. But for you listeners, um, one of the things that um, – and it looks like Megan has a lot to say on this. So this will be good for all of us because I love to learn how different practitioners are you know, seeing this stuff. But one of the things that I have over the last, I would say, 15 years or so just become acutely aware of is that individuals, and it doesn't have to be childhood development, adolescent development, young adult development. We certainly have these difficult trials, tribulations, sometimes capital T traumas, although I think that gets overused an awful lot, like this idea of trauma, it has to be sexual abuse or physical abuse or, or world war, you know, being in a war or something. From my perspective, when, when our nervous system encounters anything that is uh, difficult at the time, when we don't have the knowledge, the experience, the know-how, anything like that, we just don't have the way of managing and thinking about this. Our nervous system can't cope with it. It ends up being a too much of a stress on the system. And what I've been surprised at the last 15 years or so is that how the research shows that going all the way back to our childhood, if we've had things like, you know, in the research, they call it ACEs or adverse childhood events and things like that, that our nervous system, if you imagine for the listener, if you imagine a dimmer switch, you know, obviously you can you don't dim that switch up and down. Now imagine taking the dimmer away and that now your light switch is either stuck in the on position, the lights won't go off or it's stuck in the off position, the lights won't go on. That it seems that our nervous system 
can act very much like a light switch. And when we have these difficult events, it can cause a dysfunction in the nervous system such that the nervous system either hyper responds to things or hypo responds to things. PTSD is an example of this in, for adults, right? Like, and, and we think about PTSD with war, but you know, let's take it like this. You, you walk in and, you know, find your lover with another person. That's like a PTSD situation. You go into work and you lose your job and you're out of a job. That can be a PTSD situation. So I'm wondering in your experience working with clients, how much of this stuff have you seen be the beginnings, like you talked about going to college, very stressful time, and then adding on all this other stuff. How often do you see this being the origin story of many people's illnesses? Is it 5%, 10% estimate? I mean, I'm just curious how you see these things. Yeah, well, that's a great question. I'll try to come up with a number, but it's definitely higher than 5 to 10%. I think it's very frequent. I don't I always share this part of my story, but I'm happy to in this case because I think it really illustrates what you're saying. Right before I went to college and started this running and all of this kind of stuff, in very rapid succession, I lost a close family member to suicide. I had two of my grandmothers, maternal and paternal, both pass away from ALS, which is, if anyone knows that condition, it's a brutal condition. And I really, um, I did not realize the impact that that had on me, but I know right then my nervous system was trained because if you layer on top of that, my parents, very well-meaning, they praised me for achievement. And again, very well-meaning. They knew that they were making me happy. They knew that I was a great achiever. But when I saw my family crumbling and I felt crumbling inside, and the only praise I was getting was for achievement, that taught my nervous system, fire, 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 go. Stuck in that sympathetic mode is safe. Even though sympathetic fight or flight, that feels unsafe, right? That is an alarm signal to our body. But my body, I strongly believe, got stuck in that in that phase, in that nervous system firing pattern. And it was very hard to unwind. And I still uh, need to get to be very conscious of that's my wiring. And if I don't treat myself very well, look, we all have stressful days and we all have, you know, days where we don't eat perfectly and all this. That's not what I'm saying. But over periods of time, if I don't treat myself well, I can slip back into that in an absolute instant. Mm. So I know that for me, that's part of a big part of what happened. And I would say my guess, since I promised you a number, I would say 40 to 50% of people have something, uh, maybe not similar to my story, but but something where they experience these little T traumas and their nervous system did get stuck. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, I don't know that I would venture a guess either, but it's a lot. It's a lot of people. Uh, and the way I see this, just for the listener too, is like to me, I see it as like the sympathetic system. You have stress. And if it's short-lived, then you can uh, rise to it. it. It goes from stress to strength. You know, you get resilience, yeah. right? So stress in and of itself, as long as we can cope with it, but as stress continues, we get we move into striving mode. And as it continues, we go into struggle mode. And if it continues even longer and or it's a very extreme stress, we go into shock mode. And yes, we oftentimes can get stuck in those. And so when I see clients and patients coming to me and I see them as go, go, go over exercise types, you know, obsessive about food and all the things I do wonder oftentimes. And then they're complaining of health complaints. I often kind of go, okay, this might be someone who's stuck in striving or struggle mode and they don't realize it because our culture celebrates striving mode at least like when, you know, people stuck in striving mode tend to be view themselves and culture tends to view them as productive and it can have Mm -hmm. health consequences. And a lot of people don't uh, realize that, you know, someone who over exercises and is not yet is not sick from it oftentimes doesn't see that as why they might have anxiety or depression or other things that it's part of the coping mechanism of the nervous system uh, stuckness. And so I do think this is another big piece of this. If we're going to talk about neuroendocrine, you know, immune uh, dysfunction, we want to go, okay, what all, 
you know, causes issues with the nervous system. And then the final place I want to go with this discussion is let's go even one step back, right? So we talked a little bit about, you know, the signs and symptoms, the immune stuff. We talked a little bit about the endocrine hormone system, the hypothalamus, adrenal, thyroid, uh, gonadal axes. We talked a little now about the nervous system. Let's go back just one more step and talk about like the idea of psycho, neuro, endocrine, immune, this whole idea of the psychology behind, you know, you mentioned in your story, you know, some of these uh, difficult events, you know, and here's the interesting thing. Will we call them uh, traumatic? You know, certainly for some people, we would call those traumatic. They're certainly some of the most difficult things any human can deal with, a suicide, loss of loved ones going through a a hard illness. But even things like, you know, I have a a story when I was a kid that many people will laugh at, but was in in hindsight, I look at it like, okay, this was perhaps uh, a form of uh, trial tribulation, maybe even trauma for my nervous system where I got left at the baseball park for about two hours and was sitting there in the dark when I was six or seven years old. A very simple thing. My parents came and got me. We know what happened. They probably got home. Oh my God, where's Jade? I thought you were getting him. No, I thought you were getting him. Then they come and get me. But that fear of sitting there alone at a time where we don't have cell phones and I was just alone at the baseball park and didn't have, that also was a, a situation that caused me. And I see now being the youngest of four, uh, things like that would happen. I have a difficult time uh, trusting. Uh, I'm very independent as a result of it. I don't let a lot of people help me. I'm not a good receiver. I'm an amazing giver, but I'm not a good receiver. Lots of this psychology sort of goes into uh, the way that I sort of live my life outwardly, but it also permeates my nervous system, which then permeates my endocrine system, which permeates my immune system. And I do think this is not an area that anyone is really talking about uh, in medicine. How exactly are our thoughts and feelings relating to our uh, nervous system holding pattern, our hormonal function, and our uh, uh, immune-related way that our immune system relates and is able to keep us healthy? I think it is such a fascinating field. And if I am, if you just catch me reading about something or something like that, it's probably in this area. I am so fascinated and so excited to see what we learn in the next decade, two decades about this, because I think it's so powerful. And right now on the one side, we have some of these more woo-woo, but frankly, I think very interesting studies where they'll take plants and they'll just speak negative words to the plants and the plants wither or something like that. And some people look at that and they're like, well, that's ridiculous. And then we have another side, which we're starting to actually see, okay, physiologically, people are now hearing the vagus nerve connects the brain and the gut. And just as many messages go up from the gut to the brain as do go down. And that's where all our neurotransmitters are uh, uh, generated and all of this. So people can attach to the physiology and see, oh, wow, there is this really big connection. But then when we make this big jump to our thoughts impact our hormones, our thoughts impact our everything else, it feels like a big leap for a lot of people. And and I understand that. But I know there's a lot there based on my experience, based on the research that's emerging and based on the experience that I've seen in so many other people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on this. I don't, you know, it's it's a hard thing. Uh, we're starting to see some really interesting research. I don't know if you know uh, any of you who are familiar with the work of Joe Dispenza, which he's a pretty controversial figure for many people. Uh, but he, they actually, his group uh, really did. He works out of UC San Diego. Um, and they just had a really interesting study that they released showing meditation, putting people in, you know, I've, I've been to some of his events. So the best way to describe it is, you know, sort of heartfelt meditation, sort of in the, the heart math Institute kind of way of, of thinking about this. It's sort of a very different. It's not just mindfulness meditation. It's a little bit more than that, but they actually showed, uh, several immune markers. One of these immune markers, serpent five being actually, uh, upregulated to a significant degree in these meditators versus uh, controls. And Serpent 5, by the way, is a it, the reason it, it got a lot of press and got a lot of people's attention is because it is related to viral uh, immunity and decreasing viruses mm-hmm. being able to bind and infect cells. And what they showed in this particular study that he did is that Serpent 5 is upregulated in these individuals. They also had 
less incidences of COVID because a lot of this research is being done during the time of COVID. And when they did get COVID, they got over it faster. Of course, we all know that, you know, COVID is just sort of, it's all on our mind. So it's interesting to talk about, but this would be viruses in general. And we are seeing some very good, well done research. In addition to much of the research in the, in the past, like Candace Pert and others who've been doing this work for a while, um, we know that this stuff is going on, but it's getting to the point where we're getting a pretty good evidence base. So I agree with you. It's exciting, but it is also a place where we can quickly diverge into the woo-woo, which doesn't mean, by the way, sometimes the woo-woo is incredibly powerful and, and real. We just have to be careful. I think we call it woo-woo because it's more like just saying, when I use that term, I more just go, let's be careful here because we don't necessarily know. So we can speculate, but let's not make things up. And so yeah, I'm with you. It's it's fascinating. And I'm wondering if you have any any other things to add on that particular element of this, because I do think it's important. Well, I have two things to add. Number one, thank you for calling me out on saying woo-woo. I will say woo-woo to me means I just don't understand that yet. For example, I go to the acupuncturist every month and I so strongly believe in what she does. She knows my body very well. I have zero idea where to put a needle in someone's body. I am not educated in acupuncture. Trust me, you don't want me to do acupuncture on you. I don't understand how that that how that works and in fact I've said to her multiple times once I finish this next doctorate, maybe down the road, I'll just go to school in acupuncture because I'm so curious. So is that woo-woo to me? Yes, casually I would say that, but that doesn't mean I don't believe in it. It just means I don't understand it yet. And we can't, as humans, understand every single thing. So that's okay. There is um, there is fake science out there, which obviously I don't, uh, don't promote, and there are people making things up. But woo-woo to me is still in the realm of great things. And then on Dr. Joe Dispenza, I actually just saw him speak live a little while ago. I haven't seen the study that you're referencing, but I thought, because ALS is always on my mind, first thing I'll do if one another one of my family members is diagnosed with ALS I'm going to send them over and get them into one of those sessions because the stories that he shared anecdotally, so anecdote, not science yet, but anecdotally were fantastic. So I do believe that there's a lot there. Yeah, I I could tell you one of the reasons I have uh, made a pretty hard right turn into this area about 10 years ago, and especially over the last five pretty heavily, is for the same reasons. Uh, Anecdotally, at first, seeing in my own clinical practice but now just seeing some pretty amazing things, things that I probably wouldn't necessarily speak on uh, on this podcast yet and things because they yeah. are, but things that you just can't explain. And, and I'm yeah. incredibly excited about what some of this might mean. But we, yeah, we do have to be uh, careful. So yeah. yeah. So Megan, thank you so much for being on the show. I know that um, you have lots of places where people can find you and you have programs that you run. So tell us a little bit about where people can find you online, what, how they can get involved with you and any of that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, it's been so fun. I know we could talk for hours. The easiest way to find me is on my website, thelionsshare.org. It's L-Y-O-N-S share.org. Everything's there. My podcast, I've been blogging every week since 2013. So lots of free stuff on there, how to work with my team and I, uh, social media links, everything is right up there. Perfect. TheLionsShare.com or is it just LionsShare.org? Yeah, .org. TheLionsShare.org. Yes. The benefits in quotes, I'm, I'm winking, of uh, starting your website when you were still management consulting and didn't actually think you were going to make this a job. You just get the .org. Yeah. But it stuck by me for all of those years and I'm keeping it. TheLionsShare.org. I love it. Megan Lyons, thank you so much for being here. And do me a favor, stay on the line. Just we're going to make sure this uploads. And for all of you, thank you for hanging out. And we will see you on the next show. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. 
Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make.